This has been a turbulent, unprecedented time for the royal family. We have had the Oprah interview and the devastating fallout from that interview. Of course, the very sad and relatively sudden passing of the Duke of Edinburgh. The huge impact that that has had on the monarchy and its foundations. The pandemic and how that forced the royal family to change the very way it worked. And of course, Prince Andrew and all of the negative press attention that attracted to the royal family. Kate has been very much a peacemaker behind the scenes. It's no secret that the brothers fell out really very badly. At one point, they weren't even talking. Uh, there have been deep strains and tensions and a rift which has really divided the heart of the royal family. And that's been very upsetting for Kate to see. She knows how close William and Harry have always been. But actually, it was Kate who ultimately brought them together. And, you know, in many ways, the royal family have lost the patriarchal figure. Prince Philip was often the one who would sort out rifts within the family. And here was Kate stepping into that role. And I don't think anyone could have watched that funeral and not thought of the brothers walking behind Diana's coffin. William didn't want to walk. And Philip said to him, if I walk, will you walk? And I think we've almost seen Kate say to William, if I talk, will you talk? And she instigated what seemed like a very natural coming together of the boys. And they did talk. We wanted, the world wanted to see them shoulder by shoulder. And they were, and I think she would never admit it because she's actually quite like the late Duke of Edinburgh, very modest, but she played an important role in that. Kate didn't escape scrutiny in that interview. Meghan wanted to settle scores. Her reaction to that story, I think, speaks volumes about her. She could have issued a statement. She didn't. Her silence spoke volumes. She was dignified. And I think what certainly struck me as very illustrative of her character was that when it came to that public reunion with Harry, whatever feelings she may have had about him, about his wife, about being pulled into that Oprah interview, she set aside and she was the one. Kate now has 10 years of royal service under her belt and I think Certainly the past year has proved that really she can deal with anything and everything that life throws at her. Kate's had a natural evolution of her role in the last few years and we're seeing her more at the forefront of the royal family. Her children, of course, are out of the baby stage, just about, um, so she has more time. But also she's developed so much um, in terms of her role. Her experience has grown, her confidence has grown. She's put in the work over the years, the nearly a decade of being a member of the royal family. And she really knows what she's talking about now. She absolutely dotes on her children. She loves being a mother. And it's no coincidence that, that her cause, her plight, her mission for the rest of her life is to invest in the mental health and well-being of the next generation. People often ask why I care so passionately about the early years. Many mistakenly believe that my interest stems from having children of my own. And while of course I care hugely about their start in life, this ultimately sells the issue short. Parenthood isn't a prerequisite for understanding the importance of the early years. If we only expect people to take an interest in the early years when they have children, we are not only too late for them, we are underestimating the huge role others can play in shaping our most formative years too. There's something special happens with Kate when she's around children. Her eyes light up, she lights up, she, she becomes radiant and open. And I think she knows that that's her calling. No, You've I been here before? Yeah. yeah. I've been here before really in the playground. The there you go. Yeah, because you do fun stuff like this, because you learn all the time, don't you? Yeah. yeah. That's good. And do you, find, do you find that you can concentrate on things better when you're outside? Yeah. yeah. Hugely impressive on many levels, but slightly...
reticent too, and possibly that's because she's, her focus has been on motherhood, and, and that's understandable. But she seems to have sort of grown enormously this year. Um, her popularity has soared, her, her maturity seems to have uh, uh, spread out in, in, in intriguing new areas, and, and I think she, she's showing a bit more of herself too. I mean, one of the criticisms I think one has had of, of Kate in the past has been that she's sort of been reluctant to reveal too much about herself, and I think the more learn about herself, the more interested we, the public, are in what they find. Kate understands um, the importance of her future role as Queen, Queen Consort. She knows that, you know, she's being incredibly uh, closely watched at all times, scrutinised. What is needed in a modern monarchy? And I think they recognise what monarchy can do and what monarchy should do. William has always been a great admirer of his grandmother, and I think he has modelled himself on his grandmother, more so than on his parents. Um, and I think he takes a lot of advice from his grandmother, and Kate knew what was coming when she married into the family. William and Kate in particular, I think, recognise that they have to remain relevant. The monarchy has to remain relevant to the next generation. Um, and if that means them opening up more, you know, finding ways to communicate, whether it's via social media or appearing in television documentaries, um, they're willing to embrace so, that. Is a, is a one -man fundraising machine. We're seeing her open up more on a personal level, and a lot of it's to do with the way that she has been communicating. There's been a lot of video messages. Um, we have been privy to some of the video calls that she and other members of the royal family are making, and that feels a lot more direct and accessible. I'm Catherine, and this is William next to me, and are you holding out pictures of your mummy's yeah. Yes. Yeah. This this is a picture of my mum and she works for the NHS um, um, as an admin for the health visitors and I'm really proud of her. Oh. Yeah, well done you. Can you hold it up a bit to your left so we can see it? That's it, brilliant. Look at that. Well done. But she certainly seems much more comfortable in putting herself forward, in sharing things. We've had her appearing on a podcast you know, exposing some vulnerabilities as well, which I think people really can connect to. So she's talked about the challenge of being a new mum um, and... I believe a lot of how the Middletons, her parents, um, brought her up and, and what they felt their <laughs> sense of purpose was. If you contrast her upbringing with Diana's upbringing, Diana came from a very unstable background, a broken home, and she, she had nothing solid behind her. Kate has got this real, solid, normal family... As a, as, a back, as a backdrop to her life. And one of the things that I think William really loved about Kate was her family. Kate obviously wants to replicate that strong family unity in her own family going forward. And she's talked about, you know, wanting to continue things that she used to do with her mother and her grandmother, whether it's lots of arts and crafts or being outdoors with the children. She's very much focusing on, on the you know, how to give them that normal, stable and loving environment to, for them to, to go forward and prosper. It's absolutely the case that Kate's upbringing has shaped the woman that she is. It's shaped the mother that she is. And, you know, I remember being told by a courtier that, that whatever she's doing work-wise, the most important thing is, is her husband and her children. William and Kate have always made it very clear they wanted to give their children as normal an upbringing as possible. So we've seen Prince George and Princess Charlotte and, of course, Prince Louis will in future... Um, go to Thomas's at Battersea, which is, um, you know, a fantastic school. But I think what's interesting about it is that while it's brilliant academically, it also has a big focus on well-being. I would think it's no coincidence that they've sent their children to a school where the motto is, be kind. My own commitment is to the youngest and most vulnerable in their early years, babies, toddlers and school children, and to support all those who care for them. They've done a great deal to keep the younger generation um, tuned in to what they're doing. Uh, if you look at mental health, if you look at um, 
young people's welfare in particular, they've both been very closely involved with that, particularly from the mental health point of view. Uh, and I think that is going to be on the consciousness of young people. And I think with William's Earthshot Prize, that will really capture the attention of a younger generation. So the Earthshot Prize itself is really a way of, of elevating people's voices, solutions that may be out there that we've never heard of or haven't had the chance to scale up. So it's really the most prestigious global environmental prize you can imagine. And it is truly global. We've got a prize who are going to filter through a number of these um, solutions to try and really tackle some of Earth's greatest environmental challenges. We know that young people are very motivated by green issues and genuinely are concerned for the future of the planet. And I think by him enlisting some high-profile figures and bringing it to the world stage, um, they are able to engage with, with that younger generation. I think that will continue. Um, possible solutions um, to fixing and tackling some of the world's greatest environmental challenges. But the only power that members of the royal family have are this convening power. Because of who they are, they can get people together. And William has demonstrated that he's learned about that with this programme he announced um, recently, the, the Earthshot programme. He's put together um, some very impressive people. Obviously, it's predicated on the response to, to global warming issues and the, the long-term impact on the environment. Um, and, and that is something that monarchy can do without being party political. And it's, also, again, it's a, a force for good, if you like. They're both very caring people, and uh, I think they appreciate the incredible privilege that they have in life. And they're aware of that, and they want to do what they can with the positions that they hold to, to improve the situation for others. Kate in particular, I'm thinking uh, about her work on mental health and, and early years is very much stemmed from the problems she's seen adults encountering, whether it be uh, depression or um, you know, family um, breakdown, addiction, things like that. They all have their roots in um, early childhood. And by focusing on that, it's her way of trying to contribute to a, a real societal change over a long period of time. This isn't just about turning, unveiling a plaque, cutting a ribbon and then going home. They really are connected to the issues that they're focusing on. I was with the Duchess in 2020. Kate launched her new campaign, her, her involvement with the early years, which I think, you know, has actually allowed us to see far more of the real Kate, you know, a side to, to the Duchess that most people don't really get to see. And I was actually with Kate um, in Cardiff for a day where she was visiting a children's centre. And, um, you know, she really does children. He would just light up the room, and Kate's the same. She just knows exactly how to be around little people. She forgets about the cameras, she's not at all self-conscious, she gets down on her knees, she engages on an eye-to-eye -eye level, and, um, you know, she's really, really impressive. And I think it really struck me, working with her, following her that day, that, you know, this, is, this isn't just a stopgap until the next project comes along. No, this is her campaign for the rest of her life. It's taken time for her to find her feet, but now she's really found this direction for not just now as the Duchess of Cambridge, but I think for her future as, as the Princess of Wales and, and later as Queen Consort. There is an authenticity in, in how they deal with, with small children. Now, again, uh, I hate bringing back the lessons of the past, but it's clearly something that William will particularly remember from his mother, the way that Diana got down to a child's level so that she could look eye to eye to children, whereas royals up to that point would put their hand down and look down at children, and children would have to look up. Uh, and that's something that Kate and, and William ha have started to do. They will make a point of getting down to the child's eye level. And it's all that to do with that eye contact. They've learned that, that um, it means so much uh, more to a child if an adult gets down to their own level. Kate is very interested in the early years of children and their development and how if things go wrong within the first five years of a child's life, it can lead 
to problems later on, such as addiction and family breakdown. Do you, do you feel if there hadn't been an earlier external in your family environment, do you think you would have accessed it, accessed it earlier, or did, did it get to the pushing point for you to then sort of come to point where you were able to speak about it? She's recognised quite early in her royal career, if you like, that um, we can tackle these problems right at the very start. And she's made it her mission to make sure that every child has the best possible start in life. Too often, people feel afraid to admit that they are struggling with their mental health. This fear of judgment stops people from getting the help that they need, which can destroy families and end lives. Initially, it started off that whole mental health campaign, a sort of a heads together thing. Harry, William, and Kate, and then Meghan briefly. Um, but she's got much more involved than perhaps people realise. Uh, and I think she might have had a little bit of experience from within her own family. Her brother James had had problems with his own mental well-being. He, he's very bravely talked about it, and in fact wrote wrote about it too. Um, and and that may have helped sort of form an idea in Kay's head and, 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 and she, she came with a bit of knowledge, if you like, about these kind of issues. Uh, children and families. And that's where she has really learned a great deal about the importance of parents' mental health in very early childhood. And, you know, she's really learned that parents need to be supported as much as the children to provide this nurturing um, environment in which children can grow up um, and hopefully be resilient to what life might throw at them later on. You're all here today because we care so much about transforming the mental health of children, young people and their families. I have learned so much about early childhood development and the importance of support for parents through your work here at the Amatory Centre. This is something I really do care about. In the same way that the Duke of Cambridge has, has taken on difficult, sensitive issues such as male suicide. Um, you know, we see, we see the Duchess take on issues that we perhaps don't traditionally associate with the royal family. So, for example, she is patron of the Anna Freud Centre. Um, she has made a real commitment to mental health, to um, addiction, uh, to helping young children and families deal with problems before they manifest themselves and become something more serious in that child's adolescent years. So she's very much invested um, in, in the issues that affect society. She's not hands-off. She's engaged. She's involved. I think she's obviously very interested in children, having been a mother herself uh, now for seven years. I think that she's also encountered so many times adults who have suffered as a result of things that happened to them in early childhood. And she recognised quite early on that if you can treat these problems before they become problems, before they develop um, and have early intervention, you can prevent so many social problems later down the line. of William and Kate and the Prince of Wales and the Queen herself have, I think, really, really, not so much upped their game, but they have, they have filled a vacuum. Very easily have been a vacuum during the uh, coronavirus pandemic. We had absolutely no tours no or very few engagements in person and of course various members of the royal family no longer taking part in royal duties prince andrew stepped down at the end of 2019 harry and Meghan uh, relocated to los angeles and they're no longer senior working members of the royal family something clearly went wrong in the relationship between the fab four william and kate and and harry and Meghan. uh when Meghan first appeared it looked as though they were going to be the most fabulous four. 
um, they, they all seemed to be on the same page in terms of, of what they wanted to do with their working lives, make the world a better place, you know, they were all interested in the same, seemed to be interested in the same sort of issues. Her and I used to go to a lot of uh, engagements and see these incredible charities doing really great work, but felt that we, we could give more and how could we do that? And so the foundation idea sort of bubbled up as a sort of vehicle to, to be able to do when we, when, we, when we walked away from these engagements. And it all looked as though it was going to work brilliantly. But then it did all fall apart, as we all know. Um, I think there's no doubt that Kate and Meghan are two very, very different people uh, who didn't see eye to eye. But that wasn't enough to, uh, to cause this kind of rift. I think that William almost certainly did fall out with Harry. Not intentionally, I think that William asked Harry when he first knew that Harry was galloping, galloping into, um, into a, the ser you know, a serious commitment with, with Meghan. Um, he just suggested that he might put on the brakes a bit. Was he absolutely certain? Um, which was a very reasonable thing to hear, for him to ask because they were the product, the pair of them, their childhood had been wrecked by having parents who rushed into marriage far too early. So it was a reasonable question from a caring and loving older brother. Harry, I think, took it very, very amiss and was angry and I don't think has forgiven William. William probably does have a major regret over the conversation that he had with his brother around the time of the engagement when Harry and Meghan got engaged. Um, when William basically sat down with Harry and urged him to just take his time, not to rush into anything, what was intended as well-meant brotherly advice didn't go down with, with Harry at all. Harry felt that he didn't have his brother's support and that really was the beginning of the breakdown of what was, up until then, an unbreakable brotherly bond. My personal feeling is that the Meghan was very unhappy here and Harry, who has always been very knee-jerk in his, in his reactions to things, very instinctive and... and um, impulsive, said, right, I'll take you home, we'll go, thinking that it would be possible to have one foot in each camp and then discovered, of course, that that was not going to be possible. The Duchess of Cambridge is a very warm, engaging and kind person. You see her compassion and her empathy through her charity work. You see that that sparkle in her eyes as, as a mother. I was told over Christmas 2017 that Meghan and Harry felt that hadn't rolled out the red carpet sufficiently for them. Um, but, you know, if you speak to friends of the Cambridges, they say that they welcomed Meghan and Harry into Anmer Hall, their Norfolk home. They made them feel at home. It was William who sort of extended that olive branch after that sticky patch with Harry. Harry and Meghan's absence is a big one. And um, in, in many ways, Kate and William have filled that void. And we've barely noticed. Uh, and we've had these little homilies sent um, down the ether from Los Angeles or California, from, from, from the Sussexes, where they tell us how we should be living our lives um, while sitting in their multi-millionaire mansion. Uh, whereas William and Kate don't give us lectures uh, on how, how we should be living our lives. They get out and meet people. They're interested in, in how people are leading their lives. The more we, we hear the Sussexes complaining, the more we hear of high court cases and privacy battles, I think the more admiration people have, in fact, for William and Kate for simply getting on with the job and doing it with a smile on their faces, which they always do. I think the business of Harry and Meghan leaving concentrated the minds of those that remained. And by that, I mean the Queen and Prince Charles and William. I think the three of them, in some ways, have probably become rather closer and have probably talked more and thought more about what the monarchy going forward should look like. I think everyone huge admiration for the way that the Queen has handled this crisis. Um, she's delivered arguably two of the best speeches of her reign, um, her V Day message, and of course the address to the nation as we went into lockdown, which was we will meet again. She managed to make people feel unified at a time when everything else seemed to be spiralling out of control, and I'm sure other members of the family will want to emulate that. We owe an immense debt of gratitude to the doctors, the nurses, the technicians, 
the staff currently working in the health service and those coming out of retirement and the voluntary workers who will be working within it. And I can only offer my special thoughts and prayers to all those who will receive care before this terrible disease has left our land. The scale and the speed of what's going on in hospitals, bearing in mind also the isolation. A lot of these patients are, are sadly dying with no family members around them. And I think for, for the NHS frontline workers, that is, that is very difficult because they are there right next to the bedside, you know, looking after and caring for each and every patient who's in a critical condition. You know, what we're seeing now is, is the NHS and the frontline workers doing the most extraordinary job, and that's really come to the forefront in the last um, a few, few weeks. And I think it's going to dramatically change how we all value and see our frontline workers. Um, and I think that is one of the, the main positives, really, I suppose, that you can take from, from this. They do an extraordinary job. It goes unrecognised daily. And, and, and now I think all of us um, as a nation can really see how hard they work and how vital their work is. We've seen them take on more substantial projects. So the Earthshot Prize, which is going to be Williams, you know, chief uh, project for the next 10 years. And it's something you can compare to the Prince's Trust um, or even the Duke of Edinburgh Awards in terms of the impact that it can potentially have. And Kate, at the same time, has done her Hold Still competition for the National Portrait Gallery, her five big questions for early years, childhood development. It feels like they're taking on meteor projects um, and getting results as well, tangible results. Her photography is, has become much more than just a, a fun pastime. It's actually become really quite an important part of her life now. And she is using that passion for photography, those connections through her patronages, for example, with the National Portrait Gallery, to stage very important exhibitions such as Hold Still. So obviously we launched um, Hold Still back in the spring, which was a project spearheaded by the Duchess of Cambridge, who's the patron of the National Portrait Gallery. And we did an open call to the public to submit images of their experience during lockdown. There have been so many amazing entries to Hold Still over the last few weeks, from families up and down the country showing how they're adapting to life during lockdown, through to some of the most amazing NHS and social care staff who are putting their lives on the line. ...that so captured not just a moment, but a relationship. You could see the closeness between father and son. Well, listen, well, I must say, I'm, I'm so thrilled to have this opportunity to be with you all today, and I feel that now at last, um, as you can see, the hereditary principle is, is now coming into effect, and I'm delighted that my eldest son is taking over from me. It's a great honour to be here with my father to accept the presidency of the British Tobacco Club, continuing that from my grandfather as well. Clearly he admires his father. Um, he admires what he's done on environmental issues and other issues. But the difference, I think, is that William, whereas Charles sort of has a view on everything, um, William is not going to do that. Um, William is going to concentrate on those core issues which mean something to him or on which he's confident about. Um, you do see them with uh, William and Kate and Charles and Camilla at the start of 2020, which is quite unusual. Um, and I think it would be great to see more of them doing things together. There does appear to be a very warm friendship between uh, the Duchess of Cornwall and the Duchess of Cambridge. Um, Camilla is someone who's got a great sense of humour. She's very good fun. And, of course, she knows the ropes. She has um, had a life on the outside, if you like, and she has learned, um, you know, through some fairly difficult uh, circumstances, how to work as a member of the royal family. And I think that she and Kate will have been able to support each other quite a lot from that point of view. She's really eased into the role and she looks really comfortable doing what she's doing. She's got her own style. Uh, it is, I mean, I, I find her hugely admirable because she very often appears, and, and during the lockdown period, appeared a lot alongside William. She doesn't take over from William at all. They are, they are like equal partners. She is not outshining him. She's not making any bid to be in competition with him. She's good on her own, and, and they are very good together. Uh, and, and, of course, it is reminiscent of, of another era. I mean, it's, you know, you could turn the clock 
back 30 years to the early days of Charles and Diana and the way they engaged so purposefully around the world. And, and it's a, a, an echo of all that. One of the key um, things I think that makes it work for them is their shared sense of humour. So it's quite self-deprecating. There's a lot of um, very affectionate uh, teasing of each other. And there's this competitive edge, which is always great fun to watch. I particularly enjoyed them having a go at um, Gaelic football on their visit to Norway at the start of 2020. There was a lot of discussion about who was handling the hurling stick better. I mean, they're both incredibly competitive. They were both very good, uh, sporty young people in school and university. Um, and, and I, you know, it's something they're they're quite prepared to show in public. I mean, many members of the royal family dare to um, reveal that side of their character. Now, who's going to pick up the first ball? Okay. So the first number is five and eight, fifty-eight. Having done a virtual bingo calling session with a care home in Cardiff, as soon as they were able to travel, once restrictions were lifted, they headed down to Cardiff to visit the residents. Um, some of whom, you know, remembered this call having happened. Others were less certain. Do you remember we came, you, you might not recognise the faces, but we did the bingo with you. Yes. You won. Yes. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> was it that bad? It was one of those moments which was just a complete joy to witness. They clearly really enjoy it when things don't quite go according to plan. And at one point, this lady also asked Kate, are you his assistant? Uh, which she took with great good grace. And she just sort of giggled and said, yes, well, I've, I've been your assistant for a very long time. They're the sort of couple that will finish each other's sentence. You know, Kate knows what William's thinking before he's even said it. Um, she'll, she'll crack a joke that'll make him laugh. William and Kate are, are very good at using humour, much as the Duke of Edinburgh, although he has sometimes been criticised for it. Um, and it's all about breaking the ice and making people feel comfortable. And I think it's important to remember that perhaps they don't always get the tone right, um, but what they are doing is saying to people, I'm laughing at myself, I'm laughing at this situation, it's OK, you can relax. And I think that is really appreciated by some of the people that they encounter. I believe that the Queen feels very optimistic about the future of the monarchy because she has a son who has had years and years and years of training. Um, the Prince of Wales, when he does become king, I'm sure will be a very good, very effective king. But the real future, of course, of the monarchy lies in William and Catherine. And, you know, the Queen has had many years a lot of opportunity to counsel, to guide, and to prepare William for this role, with Kate by his side. Where there is, I think, a, a relevant point is the role of monarchy. And um, at times of national crisis, um, monarchy seems more relevant than ever. And when we have a, a very divided nation, as we do, and political infighting that carries on on a daily basis. The fact that the royal family can sort of transcends all that and can make us feel better about ourselves um, is a good thing, and it's really where William and Kate have been in their element, at sort of smoothing over troubled waters, if you like. In terms of uh, William and Kate preparing for their future roles, it's ongoing work, and it's something that has been um, ongoing for since the time of their marriage. <laughs> They are stepping up, though, into more serious positions. We're seeing them take on bigger diplomatic roles. They had, um, you know, high-level tours to Pakistan. It was really important to come to Pakistan and, and, one, again, see all the different range of environments there are in Pakistan and really trying to get a feel of, of, of the country, but also to, to use our voice to lend our, our position and, and our visit. To, the young are getting very engaged in what's going on, and I think it's fantastic that we can, can all come together and really have a very good conversation about what we need to do and the action needs to happen very soon because a lot of people rely on this and if we take too long about this we will lose many of the precious things we care about. William's been to Israel and the occupied Palestinian territories. There was a big trip to Ireland at the start of 2020. And these are all politically sensitive 
tours that you'd expect a senior member of the family to undertake. And the fact that they've been given these responsibilities is, you know, is just one level of the preparation for their future roles that's taking place. The crises, if you like, for monarchy during uh, lockdown, of course, was it, it depends on its visibility, being seen. Uh, and they couldn't be seen in the conventional way. But Kate, I think, and William, too, uh, grasped the, uh, the metal in a remarkable way. And they, they realised that they could use technology to overcome these obstacles. And I think that's why we saw them become the Duke and Duchess of Zoom and, and Skype and everything other measure they could use to get out there and, and, and be seen in that way. The royal family um, have understood that this is a scenario where they have to be visible, they have to um, bring some like, relief in some ways, but also to show some um, stability and unity at a time when the country's really struggling. But they use that opportunity to, to spread the message, if you like, that the monarchy's still here, we're here, how can we help, what can we do? You can compare it to the late King George VI and the Queen Mother going out um, to the East End and visiting homes that have been bombed during the Blitz. It's about being there as a stable, um, reassuring presence. And I think William and Kate have done incredibly well. They have spoken to doctors, midwives, uh, teachers. They've you know, done the round of key workers, trying to boost morale, but also to say thank you on behalf of, of a nation that is very grateful. What, one of the things that will remembered about lockdown will be the sight of William, Kate and their three children standing outside their front door clapping for carers on those Thursday nights when the whole nation came together. That was a, a scene that was replicated across the nation and it was very much a moment of them saying that we, we are going through this too. They were living the same experience. Kate talked about missing her family, she wasn't able to visit them for many months and that's something that a lot of us can relate to. William, Kate, Charles, Camilla, the Queen, what they are all exhibiting is, is real leadership, a sort of moral leadership. They are all people who do actually have a great strength of character. They are using their position to reassure, to stiffen our resolve. If we can just concentrate on the last six to nine months, I think the way that Kate, a uh, role really as, as, as being uh, how the nation relates to it and what it expects from the monarchy, um, they have become uh, the sort of the, the, the Figures. It must be very reassuring to the Queen, to the Prince of Wales, for the future of the monarchy, that in William and Kate, a young future King and Queen, they have a couple who, who do have that ability to connect, and a couple who want to be visible, want to be seen, um, will rise to a challenge when it's called for, um, and can be accessible. It sends out a strong message that the UK's you know, keen to do business, um, they are, as I've said before, the weapons of soft diplomacy. For a long time, she was criticised for being a sort of an empty vessel. She smiled a lot, she looked great, but there wasn't much going on. She's a bright girl, make no mistake about it. She had a good education, she got a good degree, and she's, you know, using some of that sort of natural intelligence that she possesses. I mean, she was a, a girl from a middle-class family in Bucklebury, in, in Berkshire. She went to Marlborough. She then took a gap year before she went up to St Andrews. She's a shy person, I think. She's not, you know, prone to big, showy public demonstrations. And I think, you know, she's probably had to work quite hard at honing the public speaking and becoming more relaxed for the cameras. Um, but at the same time, I think she, she is a strong person and that must come from her background. I think what we've seen in Kate over the last year, two years, is she has grown into the part. She's had her children now, but she has... Essentially, she's ready, I think, to take on the world. She wasn't sort of quick off the blocks and, and racing to make an impression. She has learned and she's sort of grown into the role as her responsibilities have increased. She was always going to be measured against Diana as a future Princess of Wales. It was inevitable. But I think what Kate has succeeded in doing is carving her own niche and being her own person. She is going to be the next Princess of Wales. I think that was a, a title that sort of overwhelmed her at one stage, but I think she's now ready for that. And in time, she's going to be queen. Um, she's going to be a very different kind of queen than, 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 we, than we've had in, in, in the last few years, of course. But that's all something for the future. Well, I will always remember the photograph of Kate Middleton, as she then was, sitting on the top deck of a bus in traffic in Chelsea, looking out at the horizon, daydreaming about goodness knows what. 
but one wonders if that daydream might have been about what would one day be her life. And here we have a future Princess of Wales, a future Queen Consort, and you know, an absolutely sparkling asset for the royal family. She has the responsibility of uh, protecting the brand, just as much as things, but she's had a long apprenticeship as well. For however long um, Prince Charles is king, it isn't going to be for a long time. I mean, he's, he's in his 70s, and I think that is widely accepted. So at some stage in many people's lifetimes, um, William will be on the throne.